Awesome. Welcome, everybody. I'm Lucinda Bliss. I'm the Associate Provost and Dean of Graduate Professional and Continuing Education. And uh, I'm excited to welcome you this evening so we can learn a little bit more about the Communication Design Certificate. It's a certificate that's gone through um, some renovations in the last uh, year, which have made it very popular, really exciting, and very flexible for students who come to it with um, a wide range of needs. So you've got a dynamite uh, collection of staff program uh, director. Um, Alyssa is here and some alums faculty who are um, all going to answer your questions and share a little bit about their experiences. So sadly, I love sitting through these because it makes me so excited about the programs we offer, but I have to jump to another commitment tonight. I know you're all in good hands and just wanted to be sure to say welcome. And, you know, if after tonight you have more questions, we're all available to you. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton, I believe, to Program Director Alyssa Aronson and just want to say welcome and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy lives to, to join us and learn more about MassArt and the program. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Lucinda. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alyssa Aronson. I'm the Director of Communication Design Certificate Program. I also teach uh, Foundations of Graphic Design and Typography in the program. And... Um, yeah, we're really thrilled that uh, we have all you here tonight. And um, just quickly, what we're gonna do this evening is um, we've got uh, an alum from the program, a couple faculty, a couple of current students um, and some staff of uh, Mass Art staff. And um, each of those people is gonna give you a quick introduction. Then we're gonna have a couple of presentations and then we're uh, gonna have uh, time for uh, lots of Q&A at the end. So um, let's, uh, let's go to the introductions. Um, so Jackie, you wanna introduce yourself and then pass to the next person? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Jackie Knight. I'm the Director of Continuing Education and uh, welcome. I'm really happy that you're here. I just want to, you to know that we are all here to answer any questions you have. And if you don't have the answer, we'll find it out for you. So um, rec we're recording this this evening. So we'll be able to send this to you afterwards. And um, you can, so you can look at it again if you feel like you missed something. So thank you again. And I'll pass it to, this. I thought Maya would be here today, but she's not here yet. Um, Do you want me to do it, Jenna? Uh, well, uh, well, I'll just say uh, Jessica. It's Jessica. Okay. Go ahead. Great. Thanks. Uh, I'm Jessica Cordero Wilson. I'm a current student in the program. I uh, finished level one, level two, uh, currently in level three and set to finish um, in the spring. Uh, my background is <clears throat> I actually don't have an arts background, it's very heavy in marketing. And I actually got my undergrad in business with marketing back in 2014 from BU. So um, it's been really fun being in, in the program. And I've, I really, one thing I've really liked is the, uh, uh, there's so many different teaching styles, which I, which has been really interesting to navigate and like pretty like parallel with like my work experience of like, okay, how do I figure out like what this person wants? And you slowly learn that. And I think having all those different teaching styles really helps to navigate that especially in like in such an artistic practice um because there's no right answer so try to figure out what someone's right answer is has been really fun <laughs> i can pass on to myra hi yeah i'm uh, myra Tomsos. i'm also i'm in the same class as jess um i've also completed level one and level two and hoping to finish level three in the spring um, and basically, uh, my background is in uh, fine arts, and I came from like more like metal smithing and like jewelry. And then, because I was interested in like making my own branding, I decided to take a class at Mass Art, like not intending at all to, you know, study graphic design. And I ended up just like taking one class after another until I finally just completely like applied for the program. I'm enrolled and I'm sort of, you know, just amazed at like the progress that you can make in like such a short amount of time. Um, like the classes are like 
you just learn so much technique. Like it's, I was um, personally pretty like impressed with like the the structure of the pro of the program, like even just like learning from other peers and like networking as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's been pretty great, and just like you'll surprise yourselves. <laughs> Thank you, Jess and Myra. Um, uh, Damon. Hey guys, uh, Damon Jones. I teach uh, graphic design too. Um, I'm a Mass Art alum, and I've been um, teaching um, in the continuing ed program for a number of years. So I work uh, as a creative director at an in-house um, company here in Boston, um, and um, I love uh, I love teaching at Mass Art because it gives me an opportunity to. Um, flex my creativity um, in different ways and to uh, expose um, uh, different uh, opportunities uh, for UX, UI design, as well as branding, um, typography, um, and all the, um, the various elements of, of graphic design in general. So um, I look forward to meeting all you guys. Thank you. Uh, Brenna, do you want to say something? Sure, my name's Brenna. I work at, in the continuing ed department. Um, I market the classes and the certificate programs. Thank you. Um, Alex? Hey everyone, really excited to have you guys all here tonight. Um, I'm Alex Barbosa. I teach intermediate typography in the continuing ed program. Uh, my background is I graduated from MassArt in the undergrad program in the design department in 2012. Um, and now I teach intermediate type. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Alicia, I, I left you to last. Uh, I think I've, I, I got everyone else who's a staff or teacher or student, right? Uh, yeah, Alicia, I left you to last because you, you, I thought you could just roll into your presentation from these intros. Sure. So uh, if you want to do that, um, take it away. Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Alicia Miesengild. I graduated from the program, I guess, last fall. Um, you know, I went to MassArt for my undergrad as well in printmaking and then kind of went out of it for a long time doing, I got really involved in the restaurant industry, but I kind of was doing a lot of work doing flyers and such for the music industry. And so then somewhere along the line, you know, um, my bones hurt and I couldn't be in the restaurant industry anymore. And so I decided I'd go back to school and it was amazing. Um, and it afforded me so many more opportunities to make design full time. Um, and so I bounced around from a couple of small studios, kind of getting my feet wet. And now I work for WS Development, which is um, a big kind of like luxury retail um, uh, real estate conglomerate all over the country but so I get to do a lot of different types of design now um but it's yeah it's been really great for sure um I just put myself on full screen which is terrifying so <laughs> okay <laughs> it's really scary it's like talking into a mirror um okay so I'll roll into my presentation if you want me to do that yes please do okay all right great all right so I kind of wanted to try to cover as many bases as I could so you guys could kind of get an idea of like, you know, all sorts of different directions you can go in. And so I picked a couple of projects um, from my final portfolio, which if you do start into the program, you will probably see these. Uh, these are big, robust uh, projects that involve a lot of different moving parts, a lot of pieces, a lot of um, concepting. You know, so for this one, the Cambridge Science Festival, this is a this is like um, an unbranded science festival for MIT. And so it's up to us to sort of come up with a concept for it. Uh, there were different elements that we had to bring in. You know, for me, I was I'm you know, I love kind of retro design. And so I had been thinking I'd been looking back at old um, like 70s uh, geometry textbooks for this sort of flat diagram design. I wanted to mix it with these sort of muted 70s colors, but then bring it into the modern by bringing in this gradient and really bring in some movement into the project. Um, and so with that, 
I kind of brought this all together. Uh, you know, my type choices were very deliberate as far as old meets new, kind of inkwells meets, I, you know, vintage IBM text. Um, you know, so these are the kind of projects you just, you're doing a lot of mock-ups, you're doing a lot of different elements, a lot of different assets for everything. So you really have to think you know, a lot of different ways. Like for this, this was um, part of the project was a um, an interactive billboard of some type. And so I did a mural that uses this thermochromatic paint, changes color with the warmth. So like, um, like hypercolor, if you know, hypercolor t-shirts from the eighties. You know, so there's a lot of different ways you can go. Um, you know, these are the little cutesy Instagram moments. Uh, and then of course, like like anything, you've got to bring in web, mobile, et cetera. So a lot of pieces. And then this is another one that pops up somewhere halfway through, I'd say the, the program. Uh, this is a study on a type designer, which I think is really interesting because you really get to know a, you really get to take a deep dive into a designer and B, you kind of learn a lot of from typography from these designers, you know, kind of emulating the way they did work. So I chose Jonathan Barnbrook, who um, he's kind of the poster child for the Occupy movement in London. And, you know, he's very anti-government, anti the man. Um, he does a lot of punk rock kind of DIY design. Um, so I really tried to take his vibe and bring it into all of these different pieces. So we've got, you know, you, you end up doing a lot of different types of um, marketing for these, you know, like here I've had the poster and then I had the kind of DIY wheat paste poster version. And then you've got cards wristbands, all these little pieces that put together your, oh, you have to design, you're, you're kind of thinking of this, um, this show that you're going to be putting on for him, this, you know, theoretical show. And then you have this book. And this is, I think this is such a big monumental part of uh, the topography section of this program. So, you know, for this, I took this really deep dive into how he sets up his type how he thinks, um, and it was a really interesting journey to go on. And I think, you know, I've pulled um, motivation from him, inspiration from him in my current work for sure. And then of course, I do love a good pin moment. Um, so now I work for WS. Um, if you are local, you probably are familiar with either like Legacy Place or Market Street in Linfield, maybe Derby down in Hingham. Um, but so it's a lot of these sort of outdoor shopping areas or sort of like experiential uh, places that where a lot of things are going on. Like for instance, they own about half of the seaport district. So we do a lot of work in the seaport. We do a lot of stuff with the pop-ups, the current that you might have seen, um, a lot of window des design, a lot of display stuff. You know, we we design a lot of storefronts. It's it's We touch a lot of different things, but it's a cool company because they are really into bold design, really pushing the boundaries. Um, it's not your usual you know, it's not like Simon Malls or something like that. So I get to do a lot of different stuff. And it's nice because I get to see a lot of my work in the wild, which is great, which, you know, these days you don't always get to do that. You'll see a lot of digital stuff, but it's nice to actually get stuff printed and get to see it when you're driving around. So I just pulled a couple projects that I'm either working on or just finished up. Um, like for instance, this one, this is a big project we're doing. This is for the seaport. This is gonna be a dog uh, tea dance party, which um, is basically, a, it's kind of like a dance party with drag performances that you can bring your dogs to that there's gonna be beer. It's a big event. Um, and then this currently is up. Uh, this is for Legacy Place in Dedham. This was a big uh, billboard project that was but we took a couple months to get together. Um, you know, it's interesting because we have a lot of different clients. So it's, this job has been interesting to get to kind of see it from the other end of 
clients, tenants, you know, it's you're gonna please a lot of people. But so I was psyched when this finally came up. There's digital versions too, and digital bill billboards up and down 95. So it's exciting. You know, my husband sees this every day when he drives home. Uh, and then this is some, um, this is continuing that. This was some commuter rail ads that were put up. So these are in the trains and in the train stations right now. And then let's see this place. So we also do a lot of social media stuff. So we end up doing a lot of animations. Um, for Instagram, things like that. A lot of different promotional moments that are happening within the different properties. So, you know, I've made animations like this for properties all over the country. Uh, and then, like I said, we do a lot of window design. So these can be really fun as well. These are kind of, these will pop up sometimes if there's, um, you know, an open tenant. Um, if something's coming in, needs to be filled, whatever it is. And again, like, Every property that we have is very branded, but it's nice because we get a lot of design freedom within each brand. And then we do a lot of integrated campaigns for different events, different um, kind of like ongoing, I don't know, ongoing things that they've got going on. Like, for instance, this was a big summer stroll moment and then a big holiday stroll. And like, these are really cute. You know, I brought this little seagull in and they just, they went wonky for it. And so now I get to put the seagull in everything and they want me to dress them up and all these different like <laughs> outfits and what doing they want to make, they want me to make a seagull with them eating a roast beef sandwich because it's the North shore. It's very silly, but it's great. You know, um, you know, and then like I said, we've got our different properties have such different brand guidelines that you're working with cartoon seagulls one day, and then you're working with these very bespoke hand-drawn illustrations, you know, in the same day. So it's, it's an interesting mix. Definitely keeps you on your toes. You know, there's another example of an event that's, I guess, just passed, but you know, we do the different signage and sidewalk vinyls and Instagram frames, all sorts of stuff. And then sometimes you do signs of don't make your don't let your dog poop on the grass. And then, <laughs> thank you, Alicia. You're welcome. Great. So uh, We'll um we'll save all the questions for for later because it's not going to be that much later. Alex's going to give his presentation and then then we'll have you know ask questions about the program. We can ask questions to our faculty, to our current students, to Alicia, the alumni. Um, yeah, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So um, let's move on to Alex's presentation. Perfect. Let me pull it up. Um, so everyone, as I said previously, I'm Alex Barbosa, I teach intermediate typography. Um, so I'm going to walk you guys through a presentation I put together that kind of shows the stuff that we really focus on in immediate, intermediate typography, some examples of past student work, and kind of walk you through the process once you're in the course, and kind of like how you take a project from start to finish. Um, so with intermediate typography, you know, the main thing that we're focusing on is building on the skills that you've learned using typography. Uh, we do that with two projects, which is a cookbook and a type designer exhibition, which you guys got a sneak peek once you, once you saw Alicia's uh, project that she had in there. Um, they're one of my two favorite projects because they really build upon using typography in like multi-page publications uh, here in a cookbook and using type in a lot of different areas um, once you get to the type designer project. Um, so what we're doing is we're developing your ability to create sophisticated typographic layouts, both in a printed book form and also in many different assets with the type designer project. Um, and on each page, I have examples so you guys can see these are past work, works completed within my course. Um, so the first project would be a cookbook project. Um, here I have a couple of examples of past work that my students have done, uh, both showing you the recipe pages, um, the exp uh, wow, the um, the covers, and the uh, expressive type chapter openers. Um, so here's a good swash of elements of the cookbook. 
Um, and once we go on this page, you'll actually see a cookbook from start to finish. Uh, so in this course, we focus on doing the recipe pages first, then we switch off to the expressive type chapter openers, which are a fun moment just to play with typography in a larger scale, something that not, you're not used to. Um, so if we flip back to the previous page, you'll see these are examples where students really had fun with the typography. Um, with the course, I really wanted, we really want you guys to kind of explore type, not just typesetting, body copy, and titles, but also like having fun with type, using type as image, creating movement with your typography. Um, so as we come here, you'll see a full cookbook project uh, from the first page to the last page. So the cover, the table of contents, and the recipe pages. Um, so this is the first project. The second project we, fo we focus on in my course is a type designer exhibition. Uh, so here I have a couple of examples of different spreads and different elements of that project that I pulled out from the past years of my students. Um, so this project has many parts. It has a poster, a booklet, a ticket, uh, an exhibition wall. Um, and all of these are meant to teach you how to use typography both in a smaller scale, so a ticket in a printed booklet, and then how to use typography on a larger scale. So how do you create an impactful entrance to the exhibition? Or how do you make an impactful poster that'll stop someone um, in their tracks? They wanna learn more about the exhibition. Um, and finally, just like a printed invitation, like what happens when the user gets the invitation to the exhibition. Um, so those are the two main projects that we focus on in this course. Um, and here's an example of one complete project where you can see um, how this student took their type designer, um, which, as Alicia mentioned before, uh, you choose one type designer to focus your project on. You learn everything you can about them. You learn kind of what influences them, uh, what's like the ethos behind the, the, the type that they've kind of created. Um, and then we really just focus the exhibition on that one type designer. Uh, so this student chose Trey Seals. His type is influenced by the civil rights era. Um, so that deep down in her concept influenced a lot of the stuff that she created for this project. Um, so it's using a lot of like a lot of cardboard, a lot of hand painted signs, um, and then she pieced together this exhibition. Uh, so we have the booklet, a poster, a ticket, exhibition wall, and also digital ads because I find that as an active designer in the field. We always tend to be working on digital ads, so having that in the project gets you get, gets you used to um, translating your designs into a smaller, digestible form. Um, so those are the two projects. I also wanted to walk you guys through uh, what the process looks like. Um, so here I'm selecting one student's work. Um, it's the process of creating the Gothic Gourmet, which is a fun cookbook that one of my students made last semester. Um, and you can see the process from when we first started the con conceptualizing this project to the end. Um, so in my course, I really put a big emphasis on creating a strong, a strong concept or a foundation for your project, and then kind of moving that forward every week. Um, so here you'll see the mood board for the Gothic Gourmet. Uh, this student really chose to focus on the Gothic era. So she's pulling inspiration from these books. You know, the photography is dark and moody. Um, and these are just kind of the reference images that she pulled that kind of give you the feeling of what her project is going to be. Um, I also pulled in her recipes that she chose because I thought they were fun as well because they focus on, uh, they kind of fit the mood, they fit the idea, they fit the concept of her cookbook. Um, so when we start the cookbook, there's a big emphasis on solidifying your concept, having a nice foundation because your concept is something we'll always refer back to when we're making decisions with the cookbook. Um, so after we do the mood board and concept, we move into creating your initial layouts for your recipe for your cookbook. Um, here I'm showing three examples, but I have my students doing six examples of different grids and kind of laying in their content within there. Um, here you'll see that she chose a typeface that kind of fit the Gothic feeling, but we were also exploring other typefaces. Um, in the end, we found that, you know, like this typeface might not feel right for the full cookbook, but you know, it's all a process. So we did six versions, we narrowed it down to one, 
Um, and this is the follow up to that first initial exploration into the layout. Um, so here she kind of figured out she wanted one layout, one grid structure, and she put her three recipes within it. Um, so here we're looking at the type, we're looking at where the, uh, the layout or the grid might break. So for this orange, uh, this blood orange tart, you can see the directions are very long. So if it had been any longer, we would have to readjust kind of her, her decisions in terms of her layout. Um, so here you can see she put her three recipes in one grid. Um, and because it's gothic, she wanted to use like blood orange, blood, blood red um, for her primary like spot color. And she wanted it to feel moody, like it's an old archaic book that she found. So she has this textured background paper in the background. Um, after we focus on selecting one layout, we look at introducing imagery. Um, so here you can see it's the, it's in line with her mood board. She wanted very moody pictures that fit in line with her concept of the Gothic gourmet um, look and feel. So after we have gone here, you know, this is where we start refining the layout and seeing what's working and what's not working. Um, so the next round of these recipe pages, we realized that the background was too dark. Maybe she wants to go lighter. She wanted to include an Edgar Allan Poe kind of excerpt in her pages as well to kind of add on to the Gothic feeling. Um, so this is kind of where her recipe pages ended up. Um, so you can feel, you can see it's a lot lighter. You know, we really refined the typography so it feels nice on the page. Um, and you can see up here she has the quotes that she put in there. Um, so after this, you know, we focused on the recipe pages for a couple of weeks. Then we have all the other pieces of the cookbook. Um, so then we start looking at what does the cover look like? And based off of the initial exploration she did in terms of typography and the color palette and all the other stuff she figured out in the recipe pages, we started looking at the covers. Um, so here are a couple of examples where she kind of went really far out, wanted a really ornate cover that looked like one of the inspiration images that she pulled. Then we decided like maybe we can pair it back. Let's see kind of where this, um, how far we can take it and then we can reel it back in if it goes too far. Um, so these are the covers she was exploring. Um, and then for her table of contents and section uh, expressive type section openers, these are two examples. Um, we looked at these and we thought, you know, these are cool. They're starting to feel like they're going in a cool place, but let's revisit the typography, kind of bring some movement, give the section opener more breathing room, because uh, right here it feels kind of condensed um, and tight. And a fun fact about this section opener, she actually used the typeface that she pulled to kind of create this cool ornate, um, ornate gothic, like um, ornate border. Um, and she really wanted, and she harped on having like a quote in the background. So we took this as her initial stab and we refined it a bit further where we brought in more life for the section opener. So she's playing with the typography a bit more. She's opened it up. Um, she's introduced this knife and wreath on top of each of her section openers. And the uh, typography for the table of contents has more like oomph to it. Um, so after we refined that, we started looking at what does the cookbook look like in total, like as a unit, as a whole. Um, so here you can see what the final cookbook kind of came together as. So you have the cover um, where it has the fully ornate um gothic border uh, her table of contents her section opener which is a little bit airier the type is more fun it's bigger um, and then her recipe pages and the back cover um, and alongside this project i like introducing a social media component because we are in a world where everything is advertised on social um, so i task my students once you finish creating your cookbook and we have all the pieces let's look at what would it look like on social media. Um, so my student chose to do, um, she really loved what she did for act one, act two, act three, which was her way of separating desserts, appetizers and entrees um, and really brought in more photography that kind of hit upon that spooky Gothic vibe. Um, and that was that. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. No problem. All right. So um, 
6.33, excellent, we have plenty of time. So questions. Um, Jackie, do you wanna like keep an eye on the, the chat and- Yeah, we'll keep an eye, Bruno and I will keep an eye on it. Yeah, and so, figure yeah. out what to, so feel free to, if you wanna ask a question, um, to put your hand up or put your, uh, your virtual hand up, I don't know what that little thing is called, or to type into the chat, hopefully one of us will see you. Um, but uh, anything you want to ask, it could be about applications, it could be about the program, it could be, you know, asking the, the students who are currently in the program or Alicia, you know, graduated from the program last year, uh, questions, it could be, you know, Alex or, or Damon, the instructors, um, anything at all, feel free to ask anything. And I see a question. Shall I read it? Because Jessica, you mentioned different teaching styles. Can you go into more detail about teaching styles and different structures of the courses? So good question. Uh, yes, uh, Lauren. So uh, interesting. So teaching styles and different structures of the courses. And what do you mean by so teaching styles and how is that, how is it different, I guess? Yeah, so, uh, so one in terms of course structure, there, there's definitely been a difference between some, between uh, the different faculty. So, so I just kind of notice more, um, like there's still maybe a structure to the syllabus, but there seems to be more like a looser type of um, way of like going about each week versus I've had some instructors that really keep to that syllabus, like it is the rule, like it is, like it is uh, the rule and it can't be broken, which is really, um, well, first of all, I mean, it's just that also happened, I guess, in like undergrad as well. Um, but then in terms of actual teaching style, uh, one of the things I noticed is how uh, different instructors give their critique and feedback in class. So um, I will say pretty much every class has like if when you come and you like show off the homework that you did from the week prior uh there is like this there's there more often than not is a group crit session uh so it's the um you're presenting your work and then the instructor will give some feedback but also students the other students in your class will as well and by the style of it it's just more the style of how that instructor gives feedback how they are presenting how they give you, um, how they give feedback, um, how they kind of structure what they expect for next week. Like, it's just, you just kind of notice these differences in like what they're looking for, uh, which I think is also pretty reflective of what you would see as a designer in general too. Like, you know, if you're gonna have a client, like they're all gonna say the same thing different ways. So it's kind of like that, the instructors, they tend to, there tends to be like a same thing, different ways. and. And you just can't expect the same exact type of class every semester, which I think is, which I think is kind of nice. Keeps you on your toes. I hope that works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I hope, uh, you know, like you, you start your first courses you'll have with me and I'm super structured. Like I want to, you know, I just, if you if you got, a, you know, if I've got 10 people and each person gets a six minute critique and it takes an hour, like you're going to get a six minute critique and then an alarm's going to go off and that's it. But then other teachers are more relaxed and, and also as you go further in the program, it gets more and more like you're in a job. So yes. you're going to get less instruction, maybe, you know, no instruction and just like, here's the brief and show me, you know, come in with three options and we're going to critique it. So by the time you, you know, you you graduate, you're really trained um, to be as if you're working as a designer. Whereas at the beginning of the program, you're gonna get a lot more like step-by-step, step, like here's the process by which you do stuff. And then hopefully you incorporate all that and then you don't need to be told you know, later on in a more advanced class about the process. You have your own process that you've learned and honed in other classes. So that's how it's supposed to work. Is it, I yeah, think I, I agree with that. Yeah, and actually to go with the, the not, they're not being really like lecture there was not really lecturing but not really so much of it as you go along i have definitely noticed that there seems to be almost like a theme for the feedback like gd3 like um how um how rob is like i want you all to focus on this type of thing when you're doing like he wants it. yeah so it's just it it's very interesting like there's no lecture but it's he's like i want you to focus on like 
doing something different than what you've normally done, <laughs> which is pretty apt for being so far in the program at this point. Um, so definitely a long, long, far, far from the uh, introduction class <laughs> that we have with Alyssa. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to go into the next question. Carly says, I'm looking to understand when the program starts, how long level one runs for and what the weekly commitment looks like. Okay, I'll answer that. So um, there's, there's, there's kind of two times you could start. Uh, we had sort of envisioned getting everyone kind of corralled into one start time, but you know, people need to do what they need to do. So we really have kind of two start times in terms of level one. So if you start level one in the fall um, and you take foundations of graphic design and typography, in January, we have a, a kind of quick intensive um, January uh, during the intercession period, uh, GD graphic design one conceptual development course. And then in the spring, you take intermediate type and you finish level one and if you're going on to level two you take ux design at the same time so basically you start start level one in G, uh, september and finish level one in uh may um but we found we have a lot of people starting in the spring so if you start and, and you know like not everybody does the same thing because people have different schedules. So like I have a, a whole bunch of different graphics for when people start when, because someone will always write to me and say, well, supposing I can't take two courses in the, in the fall or supposing I have to take the spring off. So then I, you know, kind of try to map out for them, like what, what the rest of the, at least the next level is going to be like, because we don't offer every course every semester. So you do want to do some advanced planning so that you can kind of see you know, what's gonna happen. We don't want you to run into a place where you think there's a course and there isn't and you have to sit out. Um, so if you start in the spring, you can actually finish uh, in December. So um, you could take uh, foundations of graphic design and typography in the spring. Uh, the way we ran it this year, we're, we're actually gonna change it a little bit because we have students in the fall taking graphic design one and intermediate type and, um, we're going to move graphic design one to the summer so that if you start in the spring, you can take foundations of graphic design and typography in the spring. You could take graphic design one in the summer. You could take intermediate type in the fall, and then you'll be finished with level one. And then you could start level two in the spring with UX design. So um, once you catch up with the end of level one, like everyone's kind of in the same place. Um, so that's 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 how level one goes. Levels two and level three are more streamlined because we don't have people starting them at different times. You kind of have to start when it starts. Um, so that was one part of the question. What was the other part of the well, the other part? Of, other part oh, sorry, other part of the question, Brenna. Oh, I think you covered everything. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, when the program starts, how long level one runs oh, yeah, yeah. for, and weekly commitment. Oh, weekly commitment. Um, so if you're taking, I mean. This is kind of complicated, and I think it's on the on the website. Um, you know, we try to think of it by course. So if you're taking two courses, you know, you have to double it. But also, it kind of increases by um, by uh, you know as you get more advanced. I mean, uh, Myra and Jessica might be able to speak to this. But the way we try to start out is like I tell my students in foundations of graphic design and typography, you know, ten to fifteen hours a week of homework per course. Um, as you get more advanced, there's more courses, there's more hours per course, but, but you know, you're only taking one course at a time because that's how they're scheduled. So the portfolio courses are, are a lot of work, um, but of course you get so much out of them. Um, so uh, Myra or Jessica or Alicia, you want to talk a little about um, the workload? I mean, it is intense, I won't lie, but it's a, it's a high quality program, so. And I think as long as you go into it with an understanding that you are going to have to multitask and, you know, just sort of don't, don't let yourself get buried, just stay on it. But it's, I think it's very doable. I mean, when I was in final portfolio, which is like the most intense, I was working two jobs and had a wedding. So like, if I can get married during final portfolio, you can, you can definitely handle it. <laughs> That's amazing, actually. That is amazing. 
I will say I, I struggled a little bit with like time management. So it's, it's a good opportunity to sort of like learn how to like manage everything. And like, I don't know. I mean, it, it does get easier to sort of figure out how much time you're going to need for things as you progress. But I would say like, be ready to, to dedicate the time because you know, that's, that's what you're here for. Um, and like, I think if you really like give like good time and, and like energy into it, you'll get a lot of, out of it. Like uh, Alyssa was saying that the, the portfolio classes, I've only done intermediate so far. Um, like, I think my work from the beginning to like the end of that semester is like completely like so, so much progress. So I think, you know, like just be prepared, I guess, for the commitment. But it's nothing like that you can't do. Like Alicia says she got married and had two jobs. Like, you know, everyone has their own pace, but it's it's very doable. I also want to mention that um uh so Myra was talking about like from the beginning of the whole program to the end of level two. Um, you know, Myra's not finished with the program yet, but like you're getting some of the people on your portfolio review board actually really interested in hiring you, Myra. So it's not like you have to necessarily get through the whole program before you're getting job offers and job opportunities. Um, the more you can put into it and the stronger you can make your work, you know, the more um, you'll be able to get, you know, opportunities. I mean, some people, uh, you know, we, we have people that have children or, um, you know, elderly parents that they're taking care of. Um, I mean, we really try to work with you to, to make it to make it happen. Because uh, we, we know that, you know, um, people have other other things in their lives that are important and you can't necessarily just drop them all to, to do your schoolwork. But you're here because you want to you want to advance in your career or, or learn stuff for some reason that's important to you. But we realize you have you have a life outside of the program and really try to try to work with you to make it work. We respect that a lot. Jackie answered some questions in the chat, um, but Ming Fei asked, for non-art background, is it going to be very difficult? Uh, well, you're required to have some drawing background in, in observational drawing. So some people come from a fine art background. A lot of people don't. A lot of people come from academic background. I personally didn't, didn't come from a, a fine art background. I was, I was an English major and probably some of you were too. So I took a couple of courses. I took a drawing course and um, I think I might have taken, a, oh, I think I took a oil painting course just because I wanted to understand color better. But we really only require uh, draw, some background in, in observational drawing. And by observational drawing, we mean drawing from something that's in front of you rather than, you know, cartooning or drawing from imagination or copying, copying a picture. So to get that um, observational drawing, you can do it at MassArt, but a lot of community education programs, I know Boston, Adult Ed, Cambridge, Brookline, I'm not sure where else, but I'm sure a lot of other places, all have um, good basic drawing courses. So that's the only thing we require for an art, for artistic background. And then the flip side to that question, I have a degree in graphic design back in 2009. How will this course help me now? Well, I wouldn't want you to have to repeat anything that you already know how to do. So, um, uh, you know, in that case, I think, um, you know, we'd want to look at your portfolio and see, uh, you know, where you could start in the program, where you where you're missing things. You know, the basics of design, you know, if you've had a couple of typography courses, for example, we're not going to make you retake typography because the basics of those things are the same. Um, you know, the biggest changes would probably be in the interactive space, um, UX, UI. Uh, but, um, you know, it really depend. I mean, you know, we, we, I would assume that either you haven't been doing design, that's why you're asking, or you have been doing design, but you want to upskill. So we'd want to find out, like, where do, where do you need the skills uh, in addition to what you already have and not make you, you know, repeat stuff that you, that you already know in terms of taking taking courses. You can get in touch with me about that as an individual. I probably want to see some of your work. Thank you. 
then the rest of the questions oh here's one just popped in just want to confirm that the curriculum will include both graphic design and ux ut such as visual design on interactive web uh yes i mean the names of there's there's so many different things the names and words this used to be called the graphic design certificate program now it's called the communication design certificate program ux designers didn't used to do any visual design now ux designers are expected to do visual design so we try to cover um you know a really good solid ground for jumping off into various areas um we do have uh a course a ux design course and then we also have a course called Advanced Interactive Projects, where you work specifically on interactive projects like designing an app. Um, and you also, um, in Damon's course, you'd work on, on uh, designing a website and mobile. Um, Damon, you want to answer maybe some on this question? Yeah, so I, I think um, you make a good point, Alyssa, that um, the industry and terms are constantly changing. But one of the things that I really love about the program is that it exposes you to all aspects of communication design or graphic design or whatever we're calling it. Um, and that it includes um, the finer points of print and typography all the way to um, UX, UI. And by the time you get to GD, two um, which is is not that far along you have exposure to um, some of the finer points of ui design as they pertain to um, app design uh, in addition to in my course uh, we talk about uh, web design and responsive ux ui so you, you really get exposed to um, all these different areas and um, uh, you have the opportunity to dive um, deeper into uh, a given um, avenue um, in your portfolio as well. So it, what's great about it is it sets you up to sort of dip your toe into these different areas and then come portfolio time, you can sort of focus on um, uh, those uh, aspects that you, you wanna pursue professionally. I just, thank you. Thanks, Damon. I just want to also, I don't know if, I just want to go back a bit to make sure that we, Rosso was got her answer um, about the synchronized classes. Yeah, I was just looking at yeah. that question. Is it true that if so, is it possible to break the program up for us who it may need to be part time? Did you get it, the the classes are part the whole thing is are part time? So I don't know if that answered your question. I just want to make sure that was what you were I looking was gonna for. Say, yeah, there's a yeah. few questions talking about like how many classes you have to take and if um if you are taking it part-time you know how does that affect your schedule well the program itself is part-time um most semesters you're only taking one course there are only i think two semesters in the program where um yes where um in order to finish on the accelerated schedule which is i think 27 and a half months for all three levels there were two semesters in which you'd take two courses at the same time. Otherwise, you're only taking one course at a time. And if you're if you really need to only stay on one course at a time for all semesters, you can do that. You just will just take you a little longer to finish. Um, so the whole program is is part time. Um, the synch synchron uh, synchronized or synchronous is that referring to like um having classes at a certain time rather than yep. and with other people um yep. yeah we, we all our classes are are like that you'll you'll have you know you'll have a class say it's monday night 6 30 to 10 p.m um every monday for the for the semester um so all the courses do have synchronous meetings generally once a week but we have some different you know, sometimes sometimes they're twice a week in some cases, um, but uh, that's I think yeah, I think that it's detailed on the website. Um, NP says I don't have a degree at all. I'm a hairstylist, but I've been an artist my whole life. Many mediums: ceramic, fine art, woodworking. I'm self-taught with graphic design and work with local companies already, but I'm looking to expand my portfolio. 
is this a good pro is this program a good fit for someone like me uh, uh, <laughs> I want to go back and read it well let me just see it again um, well, Lisa says, see, that sounds like a perfect fit. So maybe you can speak on that. <laughs> I was going to say, I just want to make sure we, I got, that's why I was rereading it to make sure I got everything that she said. But uh, who's, Alicia, you said it sounded like a perfect fit. Yeah. So why don't you elaborate a little? Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, you like anyone, I mean, the course is for, you know, really for anyone and everyone, of course, but like, yeah, if you already have your hands in different creative aspects for sure. And especially if you, kind of already have you know your foot in the door with design and like yeah now this course is so good for like learning the way to do things properly and expanding and like you know being able to do much bigger projects than you probably even think of at this point and and really just getting to think in different directions um yeah I think it's perfect absolutely Thank anyone you. that's got something similar yeah, and you're, you would be in very good company as well. I mean, a lot of your peers, I would say probably the majority are in a similar boat where they're switching careers or um, they have an interest in design and this is their avenue into a professional environment. So I, I would second what Alicia said. It's it's a, a very um, welcoming place for those sorts of uh, situations. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, I do want to just add one thing. Um, so yes, uh, most of our most of the people in our program are, are career changers. Um, and traditionally, uh, most of our uh, students have uh, a degree, um, either a bachelor's degree or associate's degree, but some even have master's and PhDs in, in all kinds of other, you know, maybe not at all related um, areas. So uh, we, uh, the way we have it, uh, we have, have it structured now, level one is open um, to, to anyone, regardless of educational background. Level two and three, um, you either need to have 60 uh, college credits, they could be credits in anything, it does not have to be design related at all, um, or um, a, a, an essay explaining your, you know, sort of life experience, that's equivalent to you know having a college background. Um, I mean, the reason we're doing we do that is because there's quite a few there's quite a bit of academic um, skills involved. There's quite a bit of research. There's quite a bit of writing. There's quite a bit of analytical types of thinking, um, and uh, we just want to be sure that um, you know nobody's jumping into this without the ability to kind of you know, do that kind of um, stuff. So uh, students who go through level one, you know, to begin with, will we'll pretty much know, you know, how they, how they fare and if they can, can manage, you know, level two and level three from there. Um, but for someone, if you're, if you're thinking of just starting, for example, at, at level two, um, you know, it depends on your background, but you might be able to do that. Um, and you don't have uh, some college background, we would just want to, to know, you know, just we want you to write up something that explains your, your, your history, like what you've started to talk about here, how you've uh, been an artist your whole life and you're doing graphic design work with companies and so on. Um, okay, that's, that's the only thing I wanted to, to mention uh, in regards to that. But yes, we really are a program for people who kind of been doing something for a while. It could be, you know, marketing or, something that's sort of related to design or it could be something completely, completely different, um, but have found that this is something they want to switch into. And also there are quite a few people who are kind of self-trained and doing some design and, and decide they really want to upskill and get more skills and opportunities. So yes, it's a good fit. Lauren and I had the same question, especially after Ox's presentation. Where do you all find your photos you use in your designs? Do you take them yourselves? Good questions. <laughs> Anyone want to speak to that? Yeah, so I'll jump in. Uh, I go through a process with my students about where to find photography and how to find good photography. Um, I create a whole presentation on that just because as real world designers, we utilize stock websites, whether they're paid or there's some free resources. Um, so for my course, I walk my students through Unsplash, which is a free stock website. Um, so a lot of the photography you saw in the projects that I highlighted come from that, or um, 
I think some students might have taken the photographs and I also walked them through like what to look out for when you're taking your own photography. Great, thank you. Awesome. And oh, I just want to add, I um, introduced, you know, the mock-ups that you saw. Well, you don't even know if you're seeing mock-ups. Mock-ups are sort of fake, right? Like you saw Alicia's banners and her, her uh, posters on the walls. Well, you know, those are mock-ups, um, which are basically Photoshop, layered Photoshop files that you can put your own design into. So I actually introduced those in my Foundations of Graphic Design course at the end and students get to get to play with um, downloading some some free mockups and, and putting their their work into them. Um, are there any platforms like Adobe Photoshop, InDesign, Canva that are required knowledge prior to the course? Yes, um, we do require that. Uh, this is not you don't. This isn't. You don't need to demonstrate this to get accepted to the program, but um, it's prerequisite to the first courses in the program, foundations of graphic design and, and typography, that you have some Adobe skills. In, uh, um, and foundations of graphic design, um, I, I walk students through some projects and show you some things, how to do some things in Photoshop and Illustrator, but for the most part, you need to come in with basic understanding of those programs. And then in typography, again, I give some typography, I give some tutorials in InDesign, but most of the students, you know, have a, a, either a, a basic or, a, you know, medium knowledge of Adobe InDesign. So you can get access with, a, with your MassArt, um, when you sign up for MassArt course, you get a MassArt email address. And with your MassArt email address, you can actually get free subscriptions to the Adobe Creative Suite so that you can use these programs. Um, but you do need to have some, some knowledge of the programs before starting the program, the, the, the certificate program. And Myra, it looked like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just want to jump in because I, before I did um, foundations, I took the Adobe Suite class at MassArt with Jason Fairchild, I think is his name. Yeah. Um, and that was, I learned it like from scratch in that class. And then I immediately took foundations and then I've been slowly like learning as I go and if you don't know something you can google it but it's good to have like some some foundation and th and that was great for me and I like learned from zero so um Alyssa I just want to add on that really quickly um it, it's Jessica I um so I definitely came in with some skills but I now follow like a billion artists on Instagram that are always posting reels of like did you know how to do this in illustrator and like and Adobe XD and things like that. Um, and there's also LinkedIn Learning has a billion courses on like the all of the Adobe Suite products. So, I, and I think that's, do we get LinkedIn Learning if we, yes. if we have like a yeah, card ID? Yeah. All students can access for free. It's very, very good. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Um, so even even if you have like if you come with no knowledge or like a bunch, there's like, you're, you're, you're always gonna learn. And then your classmates also help out a lot too. All right, it's 7.01. So uh, we recorded this session and I'll be sending out some contact information for people who are here today. So you can ask any questions if they weren't answered. I, I was just gonna say, I don't mind staying a little to answer some more questions. Is that, is that all right, Brenda? Or would you rather have this, this end? Uh, up to everyone else. I gotta run, but... Um... Thank you very much. And um, it was great seeing you guys again. And um, I, I love seeing the portfolio, uh, Alicia. It's, uh, it's been a while, but uh, congratulations on some really great work. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to see you. And Alex, I know you have to go. Yeah, so I have to class tonight. tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, everyone have a good night. Good night. Yeah, I'm happy to stay and answer some more questions. Um,